Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Nolu Tando Nematsperani. I'm your moderator for today. I'd like to welcome our usual uh, participants. And if you are visiting us for the first time, we welcome you. This is uh, our 17th webinar in a series of webinars and podcasts that we've been running for the past uh, couple of weeks since the start of lockdown. Um, today, we actually have an uh, um, important guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Uh, Barry Jacobson. He will be talking to us about coagulopathy in COVID-19. I think it's a very interesting topic considering all the presentations that we are soon uh, trying to un un unravel and un understand uh, with this uh, disease. Just a few house rules uh, before we start the webinar. This webinar is CPD accredited. Uh, certificates take about a week uh, to be ready. Uh, if you want to query uh, about your certificate, please send your email to cpd at discovery.co.za. All these webinars are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. So if you've missed uh, some, you may actually go back there and, 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 and view them and listen to them. Please ask questions in the Q&A section. Please do not use the, the chat uh, button. Um, uh, we will welcome all questions, uh, but uh, because sometimes we are inundated with uh, high volumes of, 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 of questions, we need to almost collate them and theme them so that we can get a prof to address them as, as best as he can. Um, at the end of this uh, talk, we will have a poll. Please give us some feedback in terms of how you've experienced uh, the, the webinar. Just a brief uh, bio uh, for Prof. Jacobson. He is the Prof. of Hematology at Beth University. He's the Head of Clinical Hematology in the Department of Hematology at uh, NHLS. And uh, he's also the Clinical Head uh, of the Homeostasis, uh, Hemostasis and Thrombosis Unit of the Department of Hematology at Charlotte Matlake Hospital. He was involved in establishing the South African Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis and was elected as the first president. He was the chairman of the committee to establish South, Africa, South Africa's guidelines for thromboembolic uh, prophylaxis. He was elected as a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Glasgow. Uh, Prof. Jacobson successfully completed a course in aviation medicine at the Institute of Aviation and graduating at the top uh, of, of his class and was permitted to perform aviation medical uh, examinations for airline uh, transport pilots. Professor Jacobson has been cited in 2,776 publications as at, at June 2020. He's a world-renowned expert, having headlined multiple Congress um, presentations uh, and conferences over the years. He has been involved in numerous clinical trials and is responsible for teaching uh, hemostasis and thrombosis uh, to medical students in their third, fifth, and sixth years of, of study, and also dental students, as well as postgraduate uh, you know, registrars across various disciplines, including medicine, surgery, gynecology, and including uh, clinical hematology. So we are really uh, very excited to have Prof join us uh, today. Um, we are looking forward uh, to his presentation. Please, uh, you know, ask uh, as many questions. We'll uh, try and address uh, your questions as, as soon as Prof is done uh, presenting. Uh, hope you enjoy uh, the, the, the talk and uh, over to you, Prof. Uh, thanks very much, Nalatanju. Thank you. Oh, I'll put this in there. <clears throat> so let me just share screen. So I'm, trying, I'm battling to share screen now. Can you? We just need to get back Renault because I, I don't have. Share, oh, yeah, we'll go. Sorry, now here we go on. We are we coming back on? Oh, there we are. We're on share screen. There we go. Right, so tonight, thank you very much for all those people that have stayed awake for this long day. I'm going to be talking about COVID-19 and thrombosis. And um, before any talk, you have to put out your honoraria. And I've, I have never been paid by um, any of the pharmacy. I've been paid by the, uh, the um, uh, um, healthcare industry, other than the pharmaceutical industry, who have I've given talks for on numerous occasions, and we have to discuss honoraria. This slide, always shows, which is the South African Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, and it shows bleeding and clotting, and we're going to be speaking about the problems that, we are, that we're getting with COVID-19 in bleeding and clotting. And it stands for ex pluribus virus is our motto, which means strength from many, 
I think that's very important is that it's a multidisciplinary team that is required to manage this, uh, this horrific disease. Those of you who've been to my, heard me talk before, or been to one of my talks know that I always have a, the slide here, which is about uh, one of my heroes, Maimonides, and it's a bit tongue in cheek that I have to do it tonight when I'm speaking in front of the healthcare funders, because he said, don't believe anyone unless one of three things, rational proof as in mathematics, perception by one of your five senses, that is, you know, touch, uh, smell, taste, etc. And lastly, tradition derived from the prophets and the righteous. And I think a lot of the problems we have had with, with COVID have been because we have not really known what to do. We've just been taking tradition from prophets and righteous, God said, good old boy sitting on the table. It's not really hard evidence. And I think as a scientist, we, it behoves us to now start doing trials to get hard evidence. There's a bit of tongue in cheek with that because uh, healthcare providers, I'm always on, on the other side of discovery, fighting for them to pay for my patients. And sometimes they say, well, there's no real evidence to pay for this. But we kind of have to get evidence, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be paying now in, when we have life-threatening situations. So I'm not going to go through the whole calculation cascade because I'm sure you all know that uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways, but I think it's quite critical that you understand this slide, and there's a spelling mistake here. It should read, let me just put them up. It should read TFPI. It's actually uh, tissue factor pathway inhibitor and anticoagulation. And just basically, one starts with a vessel injury, that re releases tissue factor. Now, tissue factor is critical uh, for the formation of uh, understanding of thrombosis because tissue factor gets released and switches on 7A. It normally gets dampened down by tissue factor pathway inhibitor. If you reach a critical level of exposure of enough tissue factor, one then gen gen will generate 10A and critically here, you will generate thrombin. And thrombin, ladies and gentlemen, is the central conductor of the orchestra because if you have enough thrombin in the circulation, and I'm just going to use the arrow here, if you have enough thrombin, you will then have an amplification pathway via factor 11 and factor 9 and factor 8, and that will then completely switch off the tissue factor pathway inhibitor. And that's one of the reasons why patients with factor 8 deficiency or hemophilia A don't bleed, and patients with factor 9 deficiency, Christmas disease, or patients with factor 11 Rosen, uh, Rosenthal syndrome don't, don't, um, uh, don't bleed, is that they're on this bypass side of the pathway. This is a critical part of the pathway, and when one develops thrombin, which is the one gets conversion from fibrinogen to fibrin, and that takes about 10 seconds. So just to remember and to reiterate to the doctors, the critical central conducting role that thrombin plays in the whole coagulation pathway. And I think that's vital to remember. When one adds thrombin to plasma, one gets the thrombin time forming. And what happens is fibrin gets converted to a fibrin monomer and then a fibrin polymer. That gets stabilized by factor 30 to form a stable clot. The central conductor, other than the in, of the other than thrombin, but the major player in your life that decides whether you live or die, is actually this organ. These cells are endothelium, and they cover the size of a of a rugby field. But they're critical because they decide where you clot, when to clot, and when not to clot. And if you think about it, the commonest cause of death worldwide remains not COVID, remains thrombosis. Well, COVID's causing thrombosis but thrombosis in terms of myocardial infarction, strokes and pulmonary emboli in the pre-COVID era and in the post-COVID era are the commonest cause of death. And COVID is increasing this the death rate from this by dysregulating the endothelium. So the endothelium is a critical organ in deciding whether you live or die. It's also a critical organ for cancer because for a cancerous cell to be successful, the cancer cell first has to to transverse or traverse the endothelium to get into the general circulation and then to metastasize and then to get new blood vessels to form. And new blood vessels or, or, or um, endothelial growth or angiogenesis is a very important uh, 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 problem in COVID as well as in malignancies. <laughs> 
So as we said, the endothelium covers the size of a soccer or rugby field, not that any of us can watch soccer anymore or rugby. And lying below the endothelium is the so-called subthelial tissue, which is very rich in coagulators and where thrombosis will occur. The endothelium switches off the coagulation, and this is to, rem to remind yourselves of the hereditary abnormalities, patients with a so-called factor V laden, okay, patients with race factor VIII, patients with protein C or protein S deficiency, patients with abnormal throm prothrombin 2 a abnormalities. These are all reasons why people get an increased risk of getting clotting. Because the normal endothelium has a way of switching off activated thrombin. So the activated thrombin will bind thrombin modulin and then switch on protein C and protein S. Sorry, that went up. Protein C and protein S, and that will switch off activated clot. So now that we've got through all the basic physiology, so that you're still awake, we can now move on to the last slide, which is about D-dimers, that you'll understand what we talk about, we talk about D-dimers, is that when one has a clot, the body has a natural way of breaking down the clot by their plasmon into various fragments. And one of the fragments that we can measure is the so-called D-dimer. And these D-dimers are indicative of breakdown of activated clot. So D-dimers are, are activated, or uh, are, are, are show you that the patient has had some form of thrombus by measuring this in his blood or her blood. Um, this slide, I mean, it's just to remind myself about platelets because we're not going to be talking about platelets. It's a whole talk in its own, own right. But just to show you that when we, there's a breach of endothelium, one gets platelets moving to that area and the platelets undergo apoptosis and flip their cell surface and they go like a moth to a light. But tonight we're not going to talk about platelets. We're going to just stick to the coagulation pathway. So this slide you might have seen before, which has came from the Lancet, the suggestion of why people are getting um, clots. And I, with, with SARS, I mean, what's happening with SARS is you're getting a activation of macrophages with neutrophil extracellular traps. And the initial thought was that there was, this was causing in its own right, microthrombi in the alveola. And this has sort of been elucidated now to be a much larger problem in that you're getting a, uh, the host cells, vessels, lungs, heart and kidney via the ACE2 receptor elicits an excessive immune response, the so-called cytokine storm with a local and systemic inflammatory response. And that leads to hypercoagulability as well as an endotheliopathy or an endotheliitis. And the entrant endothelial cell becomes very procoagulant and might cause vasoconstriction. This ultimately will lead to hypoxia and can, and we'll talk about the macrothrombosis and very often a microthrombosis of multi organ failure as well. The first clue that we had actually that there was a major problem actually only came from this year, 2020. Okay, and this was the uh, study by Wang et al. And they showed that survivors had a much lower level of D-dimers. Now, if you look at the D-dimer levels in this group of patients here, they massively increased. So now we commonly will see D-dimers in COVID patients up to two and even three. We've seen up and even higher. But it, it was a clue to us that, that COVID-19, one of its major pathophysiological mechanisms was and is a coagulopathy. A lot of people said it was a cytokine storm. Well, if you look here at the IL-6, you can see how the IL-6 mirrors the elevation of the D-dimers. So it's an immunothrombosis that is occurring. And it's also from Zhu et al. from China. So if you look at all the studies now, that's now come out uh, looking at, but they're all retrospective analyses and not prospective analyses. This is a new slide for those of people that have seen my stuff before. And this is all showing that D-dimers are going up dramatically, especially in, and is a predictor of non-survival. It doesn't mean you're not going to survive that you, if you have a very raised D-dimer, but it is, an indicative, it is indicative of a poor prognosis. And one needs to be aware of it and perhaps institute therapy. But it is very important just to understand that this is, was the first clue to us that thrombosis was a major problem in COVID-19 disease. Well, 
Well, and this, this is Eric Clark's slide, and I have to pay tribute to him, because he made the point that although people were seeing D-dimers, there was no real reports of uh, venous thromboembolic disease. So his first thing to do was to look at venous thromboembolic disease in ICUs, and he, he is from Holland. So he looked at the incidence of ICUs in, in five different ICUs, in the critical, and he looked at, um, and what did he find? He found, once again, what we're seeing is that the majority of the patients were male, and that a lot of them had an underlying um, abnormal blood results, and 13% had died. But what he found, fascinatingly enough, was that 31% of the patients, that's a third of all patients, had venous thromboembolic disease. The majority of these were pulmonary emboli, and this was despite them being all on routine prophylaxis in his ICUs. Um, and you'll see the majority of them were pulmonary emboli. Some stroke muscular, and another very important finding, and I'll speak to this a bit later, was that they found that the patient that required dialysis was that their renal replacement circuit kept clotting. So when the patients got into dialysis, they, they, they kept clotting at ECMA. And I'll speak in some depth a little bit later about ECMA and what we've been doing in Johannesburg with ECMA. But what is critical to remember is that these patients require anticoagulation because otherwise their circuits are clotting up with, with possible fatal outcomes. If we look at all the studies to date and looking at the French, one can see exactly the same thing in the French studies. 20% of COVID-19 for pulmonary embolism versus 6% for non-COVID. So COVID-19 seems to undoubtedly be causing a problem and specifically targeting the lungs and thrombosis. If one looks at Saskia Middeldorf's study, uh, she looked at um, exactly the same finding, but what was fascinating in her study was that she reported that in ICU patients, even offering them BD doses of thromboprophylaxis, there was not, significantly, not a significant reduction in venous thromboembolism suggesting that there is a major problem with how we are giving prophylactic glomerulonephritis heparins in this group of patients. Um, this slide I just put up here because otherwise you're going to all fall asleep, but just to show that in this study, 96% of patients requiring dialysis experienced circuit clotting, which is a phenomenal finding uh, in, in the Dutch study, suggesting that we are not properly anticoagulating these patients, and we need to make have a lot more um, focus on adequately anticoagulating these patients. Once again, showing that um, the high incidence occurs. I think we can, uh, we can skip that slide. The the uh, the Italians, interesting, found that there was also an increased incidence of arterial thrombosis but at a relatively low level, 6.3%, and myocardial infarction, 2.1%, okay? So there is definitely an increased uh, prevalence of arterial thromboses occurring in this group of patients, and we'll speak to that a little bit in a moment. So if you look at the study, this is a study from, uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at stroke and COVID, you know, what's fascinating in the studies, you'll see that it's all major big vessels. So it's big vessels that are being involved. And these are young people. And for me, the jury is out. And here's a, here's a slide of, of uh, one of the intensivists. And I don't know if he's watching tonight. He sent it to me, one of his patients with COVID-19, who's a patient um, in Belito who developed in the middle of the night, a painful white foot. And uh, embolectomy pulled out a large clot from here and from here, and the, and, and, uh, and the patient has uh, pulses has recovered. Uh, the question for me is, is this arterial thrombus, or is this a thrombus occurring either in the pulmonary vein and going across, or more likely, we know between 10 and 20% of patients have got an underlying pattern for and then if they have a pulmonary embolism, being a paradoxical thrombosis of the clot then crossing over to the arterial side, 
either to cause a stroke or this. And I think that's what's happening. And we actually are going, I think that we can't exclude this to be a paradoxical thrombosis. And this is not to exclude, and this is one of our patients who currently is in the Millpark ICU, and he gave me permission to show his photos today. Luckily, he's awake, and uh, I asked his permission today. Uh, and one can see a microangiopathy, similar to the DIC, so-called COVID toe. And one can see here very horrendous looking pictures. One sees this with classically with DIC, we see with other ECMO patients. But this seems to be peculiar to COVID as well. Uh, the other thing that can cause it is a rare disease called Capnocytophagocanopus from a dog bite. But this is COVID. And this is COVID foot. And here, this poor gentleman with COVID hand. So this is a devastating disease. And this probably is the slide that tells us what the true pathophysiology is. And those of you who heard me talk of it before, I think this is a critical slide because these authors very eloquently uh, did post-mortems on patients who had unfortunately passed away with COVID. And one can see here intense fibrosis that has occurred um, in the lung of these unfortunate patients. And this is really intense fibrosis. And if one looks now at the endothelium, one can see a, an infiltration of lymphocytes on the endothelium. And if one looks closely, one can see uh, actually thrombus sitting in the alveolus. That little pink thing there and that there is evidence of intra-alveolar microthrombi, which is phenomenal. So we're getting thrombi occurring in the alveolus. And this slide here, and I spoke about angiogenesis. So this is a normal subendothelial tissue. And this is what happens to the subendothelium of a patient with COVID. You can see it's markedly distorted because the endothelium gets damaged and grows in a very disorganized way, so-called intersusceptive angiogenesis. And this slide, ladies, is probably the most amazing slide. In the endothelium, one can see here the COVID-19 virus. COVID, sorry, COVID, SARS-CoV-2 virus visible in the endothelium, which is phenomenal. So I think that is a critical area for understanding it. So what evidence do we have that anticoagulation actually plays a role? Well, we, we only have, re, currently we have started to get some prospective, but mostly retrospective analyses. Um, and this is from last month's journal of thrombosis and hemostasis, a retrospective analysis of just under 500 patients. Patients who received prophylactic heparin had a reduced mortality as patients who had, uh, in patients who had a significantly elevated D-dimer. So there was evidence in retrospectively. Also retrospective data showing that of 2,773 patients, patients who had observational study that the in-hospital in mortality okay, started to get better if patients had received full treatment dose of anticoagulation. What looks like to be, and from all the other studies, that routine uh, thromboprophylaxis appears to be inadequate. So that is the question that even giving routine thromboprophylaxis doesn't seem to work in every patient. So we're going to have to start individualizing our patients. So, you know, good old boys sitting around the table, everybody jumps on the bandwagon without facts and chests, so-called guideline and expert panel report. ICH just had our, we just had our ICH Congress, which we should have all been at in Milan. And unfortunately, that's obviously been canceled. That was all Zoom. Uh, but the, the experts will come out very strongly to say what we should be doing is we should be offering these patients anticoagulation. Sadly, we don't have much hard data. The, the um, critical issue is we should be using parental anticoagulation. I get a lot of questions about should we be using the, the, uh, the, the DOEX, the direct oral anticoagulants? Well, probably not at this point. And the reason probably is we don't have enough evidence. A lot of these patients have got abnormal renal function, so we can't really monitor it. And 
Uh, lastly, there is some data, albeit weak, but there is some data to suggest that uh, anti tna and specifically the heparins, have got some antiviral activity, which I think is, is very interesting, as well as anti-inflammatory activity. What laboratories have we, focus do we find? Well, we find the PTT is, goes up in 6% of cases. D-dimers are elevated very often. Factors associated with D-dimers greater than one has an increased mortality, as does an increase in your iron, IL-6 or troponin. Elevations of factor eight, fibrinogen, and DIC has been, it depends how you define DIC, um, has been observed in about 70% of, of uh, non-survivors. So when it first came out, we uh, in Johannesburg decided to start our own study, the so-called proper study, prospect prophylactic versus therapeutic in oxaparin in patients with raised the arm of COVID-19 positive <clears throat> and open. We had 10 patients. We've just finished the 10 patients um, and we hope to write it up. Uh, we didn't get funding to carry it on, so we're going to end off on our first uh, 10 patients because I'll go on to this study here to show you how many studies are currently actually got funding and are being done throughout the world. And you can see there's a study being done in Italy uh, with 40 milligrams once a day, twice a day. These are all hospitalized patients. There's um, 168 patients in New York, 30 day mortality in intermediate dose versus therapeutic dose. Um, full dose versus prophylactic and intermediate therapeutic versus prophylactic dose. What is sad for me is none of these studies are actually addressing the problem that we, that, that I think it is, and that is that we have looked at pregnant patients with heart valves, and for these patients who are very difficult to monitor, and these are not patients with good, we monitor their anti-10As, and we can get into pregnancy, and none of these studies are actually addressing that. Um, we can see uh, this, this will not go through all the, all the studies, but there's, it's, there's numerous studies and we hope that they will, uh, the, they'll should, the, the results should start coming out at the end of the year with any luck. Um, we are starting in South Africa together with the rest of the world, part of TRI, a early trauma prophylaxis in COVID-19 study. It's an open label randomized phase 3B study uh, comparing standard of care which at the moment is in COVID-19 positive patients is nothing versus low liquid heparin at prophylactic doses. Uh, and this is not going to go through the slide because it's something shall, the background is to show it might alter the disease. And we're going to try and show superiority of prophylactic and oxaparin comparing the current standard of care to reducing hospital admission and or death within 21 days of randomization in symptomatic individuals with COVID-19 in a community setting. And that is for patients that are going to be going home. So it's an open label, multi-center, multinational study going to be done throughout the world. And I'm very proud to be able to say that South Africa is the first country to be able to start. We hope to be able to start in the next two weeks. So we will still be contacting initially all the general practitioners in Johannesburg. And with the help of, of Discovery, we might be able to take it countrywide. Um, patients will be randomized to either in Oxaparin 40 milligrams once a day, so under 100 milligrams, under, under 100 kilograms, or 40 milligrams twice a day if they're over 100 kilograms. And Nolly, you'll be very pleased to hear that uh, that that um, we will be supplying the drug, and for those patients who are going to be receiving the drug, and it won't cost uh, Discovery anything. Uh, the inclusion and exclusion criteria: these are male or female patients aged greater than 55, with at least two of the additional risk factors age greater than 70 or equal to 70, a BMI of greater than 25. That's been a critical uh, point in my, in our conspiracy that in, in discussion is that obesity seems to be a major risk factor for developing uh, serious problems with COVID. Patients with, with chronic obstructive airway disease, underlying diabetes, cardiovascular disease, corticosteroid use or immunosuppression. Exclusion criteria are simple contraindications we won't be doing UNEs. These are only patients with known renal impairment we will exclude. And if they're taking anything other than prophylactic um, aspirin, they will be excluded. We're looking to, uh, for 1,370 patients, and given the current unfortunate numbers we have in this country, 
we don't think it's going to be very hard to get all these patients. Our study outcomes are going to be death and or hospital admission and obviously bleeding and diagnosis of a VTE. So we believe that using lamicry in the community may reduce disease and the requirement of hospital admission. I'm just going to speak a little bit briefly because some people tell me they've heard too much about me talking about thrombosis. And I want to talk about something else that we're doing in this field and to pay tribute to the members, uh, this, the, the, the members of the team, and that's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation and finding the best, uh, the best anticoagulant. And the leader of our team, uh, and that's Martin Sussman, and this is from time in Portugal when we're still allowed to travel and go to a restaurant. Please, God, that can happen again one day. And this is Martin placing the, um, the ECMO in the hybrid um, theater at um, Hill Park. And what is, the, what is ECMO? Well, it's extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. First abandoned in 1972 because it said it wasn't good. But now it's showing that it really is a life-saving procedure for patients that we can't ventilate with. We haven't used two high pressures and we can't ventilate them with COVID-19. Uh, what it is, is we oxygenated the blood via, the, via a, a membrane, hollow fire membrane, and the problem has been how to prevent these membranes from clotting. Uh, there are different kinds of pumps. We won't go into it. We use a, a centrifugal pump, a high levitating centrifugal pump, which minimizes hemolysis. The problem is obviously once you have blood running across a membrane, there's a risk of proteins absorbing and clot occurring. So very often, especially when the flow becomes low, one has to have this, sure this patient has adequate anticoagulation. Um, and uh, just to say you can do VV ECMO, so we take the blood from the vein and we can either put it back through the same cannula or via a different cannula, take it out of the atrium and then put it back into the ventricle, or we can put it back into the left side of the heart, but that's more for cardiovascular support. And that's not really in the gambit of this talk. This is just a picture um, of the membrane showing how the blood gets oxygenated. Um, but the problem has been to actually anticoagulate it. So in the past, for patients on bypass, we've used activated clotting times. We know that these are not that accurate. Uh, and we have been knew that, that PTT was more accurate test. Unfortunately, we found that PTT is also not that accurate. And we're moving now to anti Monitoring, which we use both for blood heparin as well as unfractionated heparin, because what we're doing is seeing, unfortunately, that if they clot. So we are, when you set up the anti 10 assay, it is, um, it is, it is specific to that, to that specific drug that you're using, and we use a rixture when the patients are thrombocytopenic because we're worried about hitting that group of patients. But, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the problem with anticoagulation is and will remain this tightrope. And this tightrope, which is the balancing act of this gentleman, because we can prevent 100% of bleeding, but our clotting risk becomes unacceptable. And we can present 100% of clotting, but our bleeding risk becomes unacceptable. So balancing this tightrope as we walk through this dangerous disease of COVID is a very difficult thing to do. And it's not, I can just show this as a slide and it's a slide and I, and I want to thank James Fulton, who's also one of the members of Martin's team. Um, they can see here that patients on ECMO, we having are often, and this is not our, our study, this is, a, this is a study from France, showing that a lot of these patients are having to replace their circuits multiple times because their because they, circuits are clotting. So it's not unique to us. It's very, very difficult to find the right balance between bleeding and clotting in these patients. So we have, still have old technology to measure the clotting, and we're still not quite sure how, what to do with these patients. And in this dilemma, I want to thank everyone and open it up for, for questions. Thank you so, so much, uh, Prof. Very uh, informative session. And I think, uh, you know, the, the number of attendees actually attest to the fact that this is a, a very uh, topical um, issue right now. People want to know more about, uh, you know, these thromboembolic events in patients with uh, COVID. 
Uh, we've received some questions, Prof, and I think maybe I'll start with the, the simplest one, the role of uh, aspirin uh, in managing these patients. I think, I think, unfortunately, I don't think aspirin is a good enough anticoagulant. I think it's a, it's a, a mild anticoagulant, and I wouldn't recommend it at this point in time. And the worry for us is that if a patient's on aspirin as well, unless he's on aspirin and uh, another anticoagulant, the risk of bleeding gets accelerated. So we're not suggesting anything that, we're not suggesting that routine aspirin, if you're taking aspirin for another reason, that's a different matter. But to take it as a prophylactic, I'm not recommending it. We don't have the data for that. Okay. And then Prof Nowax as, as a part of uh, the prophylaxis, Sorelto. So, um, so now I'm scared to say that to you, Nolly, because then you won't, you won't authorize anyone <laughs> if I say no. Uh, I think if, if the patient, if the, I would prefer the patient to be on a low mode heparin. I would prefer the patient, if possible, to be on the trial, to getting nothing versus the lump full we get so we can get hard data. If you're worried about the patient and you, and I think it's the clinician's duty to worry about every patient. So if that clinician is worried about that patient and believes that patient would benefit, then I would offer them, first choice would be a lump grade heparin, like enoxaparin and naltrexone. Second choice, if they, and that's a problem. So you have an elderly patient and you have to then have all the logistics of getting the, the, them the, the um, syringes, injecting themselves, cleaning, injecting, and then safe disposal. You've got to get a safe disposal system to them to dispose of the, of the, of the syringes. So in some of those cases, from a logistic point of view, I think it would be a reasonable thing to offer them a NOAC like Soralto or something like that. It would not be an, in, an, an unreasonable thing to offer them. So if they do come to you, I think you are going to have to pay them for that. Um, but I, I um, is what I'm saying. But it would not be my first choice. So you'll have also to the fact, also the fact that there is some evidence that the, that heparins, uh, especially unfractionated heparin, and to a lesser extent lomerate heparin, have an anti-inflammatory effect as, as well as probably an antiviral effect. Okay. Prof, do we know which patients are, are, are most at risk uh, for this hypercoagulable state? Um, can we predict and be able I to? I think, well, I think the classical thing, I think the, we don't, we have young people as well. So the point is we have markers, but every now and again, we see a young person with no markers. So the classical things have been and remain, the males, patients that are obese. South Africa, interesting enough, has a lot of obese patients. So we are in the countries with the highest prevalence of obesity. We have a very bimodal population group with patients very underweight and very overweight. So BMI is less than 20, greater than 25, greater than 30 seems to be a major risk factor. So BMI greater than 30. We have a, 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 um, a doctor at the moment who's, who's, who's uh, um, not fat, but just a big guy, you know, just a, a, like, like a rugby player. So that seems to be a problem. So, so large BMIs seem to be a problem. Underlying diabetes, underlying immunosuppression, uh, patients with chronic obstructive airway disease, uh, um, HIV were together with diabetes, seems to be a big problem. So those patients are the patients at risk and the elderly, but we're seeing it amongst everybody. And, it, and, and, it's, and it's variable. I mean, I've, I've got a patient of mine who's, 74 in renal failure with one lung. Martin removed one of his lungs and developed COVID and he sailed through without any problems. And I've got young patients who haven't sailed through. So it uh, doesn't mean that, you, you know, that you're safe on either side of the spectrum. But having said that, those other things do seem to be the predictors of um, poor outcomes and patients that get, get into trouble. Thanks, Prof. Um, there's a question from a nuclear physician. Uh, he's asking uh, whether D-dimers values uh, should be age-adjusted as well in the COVID setting. Okay, so that's a very good question. Thank you very much. So yes, D-dimers are age-adjusted. The simple thing is basically your age. So if you are 80, then your D-dimers can go up to 0.8 normally. If you are 50, they can go up to 0.5. If you are 60, they can go up to 0.6. 
but you should be a bit worried because most patients' D dimers are less than or 0.5 or less. So they can be, they should be age adjusted and should think of them, but we are seeing horrendous D dimers. D dimers I've never seen before in my life. Greater than four, five. Uh, Mervyn Murtami saw someone at 300 in his ICU, but we are seeing amazing D dimers. The patients in the ECMO ward um, often have D dimers in the region of four to seven. So it's not uncommon to have the raised D dimers. Uh, but yes, age adjustment is a good point, uh, and and you need to be aware of it that uh, D dimers can be elevated in, in in patients. It's also difficult to diagnose pulmonary emboli in these patients because you've got a patient who's positive, and now you've got a whole schlep of getting them to the ICU, you know, and um, all the precautions of uh, PPE and putting them in the ICU, and and because of the ground glass appearance that you commonly see on x-ray, uh, VQ scans are really a waste of time for these patients. If you really think they've got a PE, then they should be getting, um, they, you'll need a pulmonary angiogram to show it because uh, VQ scans are, are a waste of time. But then you have to decide why you're doing it. If the patient's going to be fully anticoagulated anyway, are you really going to get that much more, more data? Can you get away with doing an echo or transesophageal echo? What, what, each patient needs to be assessed on their particular, their particular merits uh, rather than blanket statements and blanket guidelines. I think that's critical for what, what is available in your area and what is the quickest, most expeditious and safest way of assessing your patient and deciding on its management. I'd just like to come in there with, um, there was a, a um, and I won't want to go into it, but a, a, a YouTube video going went viral about giving all these patients uh, thrombolysis. And, and, I, and we brought out a statement from across the hematology boards to say that, that we didn't agree with it, that we, we, we um, thought it was a bad idea. So unless the patient's uh, really fulfills criteria for thrombolysis, the root recognized criteria, we're not suggesting thrombolysis as a routine management for COVID-19. And I think it might be irresponsible to suggest something about hot data. Yeah. Prof, uh, the same nuclear physician actually asked a question relating to the VQ scans. Um, so he's asking if a, a patient has test, tested negative, considering that you may get patients who, have, uh, you are, who are false um, negative, um, he was asking whether they should be suspicious when they see small sized wedge uh, perfusion defects because of the coagulopathy risk uh, caused by COVID-19 that they should no, be I don't think, I think, well, for me, and I'll probably speak to the wrong audience, but nuclear medicines in that, in, in, in for, for PEs is very unclear medicine and not nuclear medicine. So, so I think if you're really worried about it, pulmonary angiography remains the gold standard. And for looking for small PEs uh, and what is the risk benefit ratio in that group of patients who needs to be assessed in your setting. So I would hate to give a blanket statement like that. Yeah. Prof, there's another question around, I think there was a question around dosing, uh, where they are asking, are the conventional doses uh, of the low molecular weight? So that's a, thank you. That's a very, very good point. So now our study that we're doing is very pragmatic study because we're doing it at home. But what we did, in, what we did and which I, which I do on a regular basis for my patients, with, especially on ECMO and COVID-19, is that we monitor the anti-10A levels. So we don't really care about the dose. We monitor what is the effect. Now I know, um, Nolu, because I know you're very cost conscious that uh, the, these blood tests are expensive, but they need to be done. They need to be done and um, they need to be done. And it's critical that they get done in a laboratory that knows what it's doing because it has to have the correct test for the correct drug. So you can't cross test. So if you're on, a Rixtra, you can't do the same test as Clexane. You've got to know what drug the patient is on and draw up your controls for that specific drug. And the test has to be done. We don't do traps. There are people over internationally that do traps. I don't believe in traps. We just do peaks. So we do a peak and we want it to be done approximately three hours after the injection. If the patient's on a continuous infusion of unfractionated heparin, and we have patients like that uh, in the ICUs, on ECMO ICUs, then we do it at any time because the patients are on continuous infusion. Uh, 
but they should be on the continuous infusion for at least three to four hours to, to achieve a steady state. And then we do the unfractionated heparin. But I think it's quite critical, and I think that's where the failing is going to be from a lot of the other studies, um, arrogantly, that's my belief, is that they're not doing adequate testing. I think that's been the issue. And we were caught with our pants down when we tried doing a study in pregnant patients with heart valves without testing. And we had people actually die on us. So I think that that is the issue. That It's like warfarin, you know, if just to go back to the old days. If we gave everybody one tablet of warfarin, and I know there was one doctor who just gives everyone one tablet of warfarin. Now, for the majority of the patients, they might be fine, but there are people who are going to die from bleeding. Other people are going to die from clotting. So mm -hmm. we know now that if you give warfarin, you have to get a proper INR. Yet the pharmaceutical industry and a lot of other hematologists are not that wild about testing. But I'm, I'm a great proponent of testing, especially in these patients where they've got multiple comorbid factors, for example, renal failure, that can interact with the coagulation system. That these patients, I believe, should be, should, that we should be monitoring anticoagulation and keeping them at safe levels. And even with monitoring knowledge, we're finding patients, unfortunately, and Martin screams at me on a regular basis because his patients bleed and then I, it's lopped and then he shouts at me because they clot. And even with monitoring, it's very difficult, these patients. These patients on ECMO are honestly a nightmare to anticoagulate. And that's with having a, a, a hematologist go there on a daily basis, monitor it and dose adjust. And this is not for the faint hearted. Anticoagulation in these patients is difficult, is really difficult. And just routine anti, which we're doing, unfortunately, because of the mass numbers that we're doing, does not mean we're doing the right thing always. So I think that, yes, if you can't monitor, then just go with a standard dose. But if you can monitor and you have the resource, you have the ability, because it's not available everywhere, and you have the financial resources to do it, it was, it's, it's, it's my first choice. I've got um, another question uh, relating to uh, to low molecular weight heparins around tinsaparin to say is it um, you know superiority over enoxaparin? Um, any comments um, on that one? Okay, well, thanks, Nola. Well, the reason we use enoxaparin, and I've spoken to all the companies on numerous occasions to try and get them to help set up testing on their drugs so that we could monitor the anti tenase. So all the laboratory heparins, really, if you look at the studies are roughly the same, give or take minor differences. But the major issue is testing. And I think that I prefer enoxaparin purely because they put the money behind it and we've set up testing and we can monitor it. And that's been a critical issue for us to be able to monitor it. Uh, Fraxiparin has come up in one area that we can test, but generally the companies haven't come to the table and haven't allowed us. And the testing is done... Uh, mainly in the private sector, a little bit at our academic center, but mainly in the private sector because that's where it's critically, ne critically needed as well as in the government sector. So it is available and we have settled mainly on enoxaparin and mainly because we, have, uh, we know we have a reliable testing that we can do mm -hmm. and based on that only. Prof, have you, have you had any children that you had to treat uh, during this uh, period of COVID? Um, so... Luckily, no, because I don't, uh, I mean, I, have the, I generally get asked about children, but I'm not a pediatric hematologist, but every time there's a clotting problem in a child, I often get phoned and, uh, and I step, I, I breach the line, which I'm not supposed to do, which is to, to talk about children, because I'm, I'm not a pedi pedi pediatric hematologist. Um, and I've offered advice about clotting in, in children, but luckily to date, not, but I, I know from the literature, that uh, it does seem to cause problem in children, uh, you know, with the, um, with the inflammatory response disease, and uh, it is causing heart attacks in children, but I have no personal experience. Okay. Prof, uh, are patients who already are taking warfarin, either for DVTs or any other um, heart-related conditions, at a better, have a, do they have a better chance of... Oh, that's of, very, thank you, Norman. That's a, a wonderful question. In fact, we are, I have a... a um, one of my registrars is actually doing his MED on that precise, well, what, it's one question that he's addressing. Well, his one question is, is, he's moving our patients because the problem at our hospital is we have a PI clinic where we see about 100 patients a day and it's based right next to the uh, virology lab. So you can imagine we have all these elderly people sitting outside the virology lab. 
um, uh, waiting to be dosed for their warfarin. And they all fulfill the criteria of being elderly, often obese, underlying heart diseases, hypertension. So we've been trying to get them as a to try and say, okay, we'd rather keep you away from hospital and keep not testing you. And the, the, the company Bay actually donated some money to us uh, for a limited period so we could get rid of some, well, not these patients would have to come to hospital. But the question that you're asking is a fascinating question because does it mean that people with underlying anticoagulation are maybe at a lower risk of developing a cytokine storm? And the answer is we don't know. We've looked at the data and so forth. There's not enough data out there to say it is or it isn't, but it's a fascinating question. And um, or patients are no X either, you know, because are they a lower risk? Are they going to get less cytokine storm specifically in the lung area? Um, we don't know. Uh, the answer is we don't know. And we're going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at all our patients at the PR clinic. And it's one of the questions that, that uh, one of our is excellent registrar, uh, Ching, is going to be looking at and seeing, are these patients some, somehow protected? But the mm -hmm. answer is we really don't know. But thank you. Good question. Thanks, Prof. And then there, there, there have been quite a few questions around factor five laden uh, to, to just say, are those patients at, an, at, a, at a higher risk? Uh, once they we don't know. I mean, we don't know. Are they at a higher risk? Maybe, you know, because we do know that these patients, when they get, when they get sick for any reason, like, if, like generally they won't have any problems. So the majority of patients with factor five laden will go through their whole lives without any problem. Mm -hmm. A group of them, when they when they become hyperthrombotic, like when they fall pregnant, the woman will fall pregnant, or they go on a pill, then they're more at risk of developing a DVT, or they're in hospital with pneumonia, or any reason that they are hyperthrombotic and they're lying still in bed, that they are then maybe more at risk. So yes, the theoretical possibility, probability is yes, they probably are more at risk, and probably if they do get COVID, that we probably would anticoagulate them. Um, but having said that, we don't know. And it's not without risk. So anticoagulation in these patients is not without risk. We have no, I know one of Prof. Mervyn Merz's patients who um, exsanguinated and died from a bleed. And we've had patients bleed. I we've got one death in the COVID ECMO ward from someone who had a chest strain who bled into, into her lungs. Um, so anticoagulation is a tightrope. It's not smarties. So everyone says, well, just give everyone anticoagulation. Well, it's not that simple because... God forbid you bleed, and we don't want someone to be bleeding, and that's that's the that's the problem. So yes, I think if if a patient is a known factor five laden and they've had a previous thrombus thrombosis, definitely I would suggest to them if they unfortunately got COVID and they were at home, or they're in hospital, that they would be get onto thromboprophylaxis, and especially if we managed their D dimers and their D dimers were elevated. And that for me, that patient I think would not be eligible for our trial. I would put that patient onto thromboprophylaxis, be it at home or in hospital. Mm. Prof, I mean, uh, there, there are a few questions coming uh, specifically from GPs saying, I think they're looking for practical advice. So when they see these patients in the out of hospital space, um, not, you know, hospitalized, what is the approach? What, they, what do they need to monitor for and how do they approach these patients um, in terms of, you know, thromboprophylaxis? So, so I think it until we have hard data, we can't say everyone, you know, who should get it and who shouldn't get. So the current standard of care internationally generally has been nothing. If you're worried about your patient because you think they've got underlying risk factors, a lot of the patients, and for me as well, are putting them onto a thromboprophylaxis. But what I would suggest to the GPs is that they can contact me um, and um, they can contact me uh, on my cell or wherever they want to contact me and just to talk to me about that patient. And if necessary, we'll be able to put that patient on the trial. So mm -hmm. they'll be able to get consent for the patient. The patient will get on, well, wherever they are, we're gonna, we'll send them the, the Clexane, and then we will, or nothing. And then we will monitor that patient and see what happens to the patient. Because that's the problem. You see, we, we, we don't want to be in a situation like the hydrochloroquine, you know? Mm -hmm. Don't want to be a Trump. You know, everyone said that hydrochloroquine, you know, if you weren't getting it, you were criminal. And we know now from studies published that it didn't work. So while I understand the mass hysteria and the panic, and this is not a joke, this disease is a horrible disease. And for a lot of people, it's mild, but for other people, they can die. And you can see what happens to people's fingers and toes. It's just a horrible disease. Um, 
So I don't want to be in the position where we say, I say to everyone, yes, take low molecular grade heparin, and then we find out that actually we did more harm than good. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, my gut feeling is, yes, it's a good idea, but I want to be a prophet. I'm not a prophet and I'm not righteous. So I need to be mm -hmm. getting, you know, uh, Harry Buell always says, in, in God I trust, everybody else show me the evidence. So I want to get evidence. And I think that's the issue. I think that if your patient's really sick, I think we don't, we don't have time to wait for the evidence. But if the patient is at home and he's not that sick, I think they should go into the trial. If you're worried, I would probably put that patient on a heparin, but I'm happy to discuss it with any doctor if they want to. They can contact me at any time and I will speak to them. Prof, uh, we're almost getting close to the end. I've got, I think, two more questions. Uh, the first one is really around uh, duration of Clexane um, you know, treatment. So the one question is coming from someone who's recovering from COVID and they've been on Clexane already for three weeks. So they just want to know if there are any, um, any blood tests that they need to do, dangers of being on this drug for such a long time. Um, well, I think three weeks is a long time and I would probably stop now. So yeah. I would check three weeks. I think the, the, the question is, from a scientific point of view, are their D-dimers still elevated? How are they feeling? Are they getting sicker? Are they getting better? Uh, but if, they have, if they're asymptomatic and they're three weeks, definitely I would consider stopping now. Okay. And then the um, other one was around uh, the use of or th thromboelastogram. Okay, so the TEG is not a bad test. It's not, I found it not adequate in, fact, in monitoring these patients it's in the ICU. So although, and I know there's a great lot of proponents of TEG, I'm not anti it, it actually was part of my PhD thesis, but I, don't, I haven't found it accurate enough for monitoring of these patients. And I'm preferring to go rather with anti-10A testing in this group of patients, personally, at the moment. We have one of my, um, she's a scientist and she's actually looking, for, as one, she's doing a retrospective analysis for her, for, her, um, for her masters to look at which is the best way to actually monitor. We don't yet know, but my gut feeling is probably not. I would rather be going with anti-10A testing in this group of patients because it's such a fine line that we're having to, to tread between bleeding and clotting. Yeah. Prof, I promise this is this, the, the last, last ones. Carry on. I don't mind. I've got, I've got nowhere to go. I can't go out anyway. <laughs> okay, Prof. The, the, I think it's, it's really about now the role of, of, of Plavix. So for those patients who've already been on Plavix, uh, whether they are at a reduced risk uh, of, of, of clotting. So it's a very good question. We don't know. So the point is, the problem arises with Plavix and adding now a, another anticoagulant. So that's the risk for that patients. You know, mm -hmm. dual antiplatelet therapy and throwing on another anticoagulant above that, the risk of bleeding goes up exponentially. So you need to individualize every patient like that because those patients really do bleed. So once you're on strong anti antiplatelet -anti agents, not prophylactic aspirin, once you're on clopidogrel or prasugrel plus, and now a NOAC or whatever, and aspirin, these poor patients with, with, uh, with drug eluting stents, mm. start throwing a lumbricon heparin in there, you know, you can get yourself really involved and you really need to be very judicious uh, in how mm. you do these patients without causing major bleeding because it is very dangerous and it's in the, every patient needs to be assessed on that patient's particular merits in deciding what are you going to do for that patient. Um, there was another question, Prof. Uh, so let me just give you the two now, and then we're going to close. It's 8 o'clock. So one is about a patient who is uh, on daily hydria to say, are they at risk of thrombocytosis? And then the last one is around perfenidone to say, uh, has that been tried uh, as an antifibrotic um, a drug? Uh, so those are the two, and then we, we can close. And I think I just want to remind, I can see people are leaving. I'd like to remind people to, to just, um, you know, participate in the poll at the end. Um, yes, Prof, so those are the two questions, and we are going well, to... Well, the antifibrotics, <clears throat> just start the second question first, but then it, uh, there are trials, I've got no real experience. I mean, we've been, we've been using culture scene and the Prof Mur's opinion, and there's, there's some data, very weak data, I must be honest because the scary part, as you saw, was that 
uh, fibrotic lung, and that's very terrifying. So there are trials out there. Uh, it's not my area of expertise. My expertise is thrombosis. And that's much more the area of expertise of the pulmonologists and particular people like Prof. Murr and, and Paul Williams who deal with the patients with primary pulmonary hypertension and, and lung fibrosis and, you know, primary pulmonary fibrosis. That's not my area of expertise. In terms of, sorry, the, the, the first question was hydroxyurea. So I use a lot of hydroxyurea, but that's not as an antifibrotic and that's as a, you need to lower the platelet count. It's not, I wouldn't as a, a line of treatment. I mean, I wouldn't stop the patient who are on hydroxyurea for other, for, you know, for example, essential thrombocytosis, but it wouldn't be a form of therapy for me for patients who have got a thrombocytosis who in, uh, who have got COVID to try and lower their platelet count. I wouldn't do that, no. So I think, Prof, the, the question was whether it would actually increase the risk uh, for, the, for those patients who are already on hydroxyurea. Increase their risk of what? Sorry, of, of COVID-19 or thrombosis? Uh, no, I don't think it would increase their risk. We do know that hydroxyurea is associated with decreased wound healing. Um, but no, I don't think it would increase their risk. We use it regularly in patients with, you know, with sickle cell anemia and patients with uh, myelo with, myelo with um, central thrombocytosis and polycythemia vera. And no, it, it wouldn't increase their risk of thrombosis, no. Yeah. Prof, thank you so much. We received so many questions. I think we've tried to cover as much. I think people were very much interested in just identifying the high risk, uh, you know, patients, and also just understanding, you know, how they initiate a therapy uh, early, you know, as prophylaxis, so that you know they can prevent uh, poorer outcomes. We really thank you, Prof, uh, for spending the time with us, for sharing, you know, you know, so much uh, around, you know, what you know, and also the lot that we still don't know. Um, we will invite you maybe in a few in a few weeks' time as more evidence becomes available. Uh, to come back maybe and share with us. I think it's, it has been quite in, an informative session. We thank you so much. We thank you um, for joining us this evening uh, for the participants of this webinar. We thank you so much for joining us. Uh, have a good night. Uh, please remember to participate in the poll. Thank you.